as a small organization you have to relate to, I assume there is some challenge. This is new methods, new thinking for the future. So um, I give the floor to you, Ms. Henry. It's nice to have you here. You have been traveling far away from Sweden to because Sweden and Norway is negotiating peace on the way you have done it. So he comes from the peace negotiation. So uh, thank you. Men det är inte det språk jag till dag och snabbt. Men det är vi på en förklaring till slut med mitt lite inlärning idag på hur får jag göra. Och vi ska nog starta med de utfordringar i näringen vi står överfor i förbindelse med mänskapet och klimatiska ändringar. Vi ska idag tänka på Norge och norsk regn. I Norge har Stortinget lagt upp till att regnkostnad ska förvaltas utan att det ska vara bärkraft. I bärkraftsbegreppet ligger både ekologisk, ekonomisk och kulturell bärkraft. I detta ligger det också någon delmål som upprätthållelse av nomadisk regnkost, ökt kunskapsnivå om regnkosten i det statliga förvaltningen och bättre sikting av regnkostens areal. Klott i ord. Norsk regnkostpolitik, olika regelverk och samfundsutveckling som har i bruk regnbäggtområdet till andra formål satte i medeltid begränsning på regnkostutövrens handbefrihet. I tillägg till samfundsmässiga ändringar satte klimatiska variationer till en del utfordringar på regnkostpolitiken. Det är You are making okay. a challenge for the uh, translation in English. Just come down. Uh, okay. You have, you have, you have the whole Yeah, I'll try to do this, and I can sit up. Yeah, you can see. Okay. <laughs> this was not very good. <laughs> oh, you both know that. Okay. Utifrån traditionell kunskap om regnens natur och klimatiska förhåll har regnutsutövare varit gott rustet till att tappa med ustabila bäjteförhåll Regnbruksutövare har också varit väldigt tillpassningsdiktig när det gäller olika arealinjer. Ja, hurdan tacklar regnbruksutövare i, i, i olika utfordringar? Exempelvis arealinjer. Regnbruksnäringen har alltid varit upptatt av att ökologiskt bärkraft och värna regnbruksutövare. Men regnbruksnäringens önsker är inte alltid i samsvar med storsamfundets arealförvaltning och behov för att ta i bruk regnbruksens bäktområde till andra områdesformål. Vi vet ju att hyttebygging är väldigt populärt, mineralutvinning, fastlagsutbildning och slikt kunna ha på om så hela dag för att finna ut det som fortsätter om det som är en konkurrent för oss. För att ta hänsyn till regnbruksintressen heter det att det i förbindelse med olika planprocesser som berör regnbruksen ska vi planmyndigheten genom planarbete sörja för medvirkning från regnbruksen för att begränsa negativa konsekvenser för regnbruksnäringen. Själv om intentionen om att begränsa skadeomfanget för näringen är där är regnbruksnäringen alltid den tapande part. Genom tiden har regnbruksnäringen alltid grejt att tillpassa bänkemönstret i förhåll till inte som har medfört tap av bänkemönstret. I efterkant av reducerat bänkemönstret på grund av inte är det alltid regnbruksnäringen som har fått krav om reduktion av regnbruk. Slik att denna är i förhåll till myndigheternas styr på bärkraftig regnbruk. Och visst av industrialiseringen av en av världens sista stora vindmaktsområden fortsätter i samma fall som hittills. Vid detta sätter stora begränsningar för regnbruksnäringens möjligheter för tillpassning. I och med att det inte längre finns alternativ som gör det möjligt att fortsätta med regnbruks efter dagens regnbruk. Och då över till det som är väldigt dagsaktuellt i dessa tid. Och det är ju, man snackar om klimaändring, men man kan ju också snacka om klimavariation. 
Vädersnäringen är ju vant med klimatiska variationer. Något som det vädersamiska uttrycket så gott säger. Ett år där inte blod till ett annat år. Där har vädersutgången alltid tagit höjd för att det kan bli vant värmas i en omslag som ändrar vädersutgången från år till år. Ut från traditionell vädersutgångskap och tidigare erfarenheter har vädersutgången ett olika strategier hur vi ska takta förvärring av vägte till vägte. Enkelte gånger så är det fornuftig att lära en tak till spre utöver ett större område. Andra gånger må man flytta till områden där det ännu är tillgängligt för en tak. Nå, i senare tider har det blivit mer och mer vanlig med tilläggsbord. Minus med forin är i midlertid att regnen mitt mister motstandsdyktighet mot vägte på ringens. Och som gör att vägdesutövarna oftare må tidigt fort. Och här igen kommer det som då är det stora problem. Arealintäkt, det är det som gör det att mycket så tillpassningsdyktighet. Du har inte områden till att ta i bruk för en eventuell slik händelse. Så därför så tyr vi till det som är lärkiskt och då är det tillräckligt och hvis vi da går videre og ser på det som er rapportert fra, fra, fra dem som forstår seg på klima. Og da hvilke klimaendringer er farlige som ble lagt frem på FNs klimakonferanse for en tid. Vi ser foruroligende scenarier som følger av global oppvarm på rundt to grader over høyt industrielt nivå. Det vil si at det ved en global temperaturøkning på ca. 2,5 grader over høy vindelskjøpnivå vil isen i Arktis forsvinne som det er. En mildere global økning på 2,5 til sier en økning på ca. 5 grader i arktiske områder på grunn av forsterket global oppvarming i disse områder. Videre skisserer rapporten blant annet om mulig utbyttelse av urfolkskulturer og utbyttelse av arktisk økosystemet i de arktiske områdene. Dette vil skape store utfordringer for opprettholdelse av dagen for regnvisnær. Men jeg er ganske sikker på at regnen i seg selv vil klare hvis det klimatiske endringer. Men noe som er dessverre i veldig tid, om menneskene rundt oss kan tilpasse seg de omstillinger som regnvisnær måtte få på bakgrunn av det. Her er det et viktfond som har ut det vi kjenner i dag, det må bli en radikal endring av det for å kunne tyde regn. For vi anslår jo det dit her at noe av sesongbeitene måtte falle ut. Og da har du mistet den bokfeste vi i dag kjenner som den nomadiske regn her i Norden. Noe som også kan være noe i forhold til fremtiden, og som for så vidt har vært der hele tiden, det er vårt problemet er det som måtte være rovdyr. For det er ikke ukjent det at rovdyr har vi hatt hele tiden i vår høvn. Og vi har alltid klart oss med rovdyr. Og hvordan de har oppholdt seg i forhold til denne regnvisnæringen, men da er det vi selv som har vært forvaltere av rovdyr. Og dagens rovdyrpolitikk er nedfelt i stortingsfelling nummer 5. Rovdyr i norsk natur. Og da er det noe annet. Da er det noen andre som da står som forvaltere av rovdyr. Og for at disse skal falle i den stilen som reindriften måtte ønske å være, så måtte de siste bestanden også være et bærekraftig i forhold til det som måtte være i forhold til reindriften. I den forbindelse så er det satt nasjonale forbindelser bestandsmål, som skal forvaltes av opprettede regionale rovviltnemmer. Med dette ønsker Stortinget at forvaltningen av rovvilt på en bedre måte skal kunne forankres lokalt og regionalt. Dagens lovverk hindrer derfor regelsutøvere å igangsette tiltak de mener måtte være nødvendig for å være grenset av av regel til rovvilt. Og denne politikken har da skapt store problemer for regelsnæringen i dag. Og man ser hvordan man sliter i forhold til de 
Och i Norge i många områden så är det ett allvarligt problem. Och det är också det, man får inte den välvilligen till att begränsa de rådjuren i förhåll till det som måste vara bägge färgkraftiga för en. Jag snackar dem kun om sina mål och internationella avtal. Och dagens rådjus Råbiskpolitik får stärkt på grund av rask industrialisering i vindmarksundet för att reindriften oftare kommer i konflikt situationen med rödmål. I och med att de har presset oss i ett färdigt område. Områden runt i Taperland hela tiden. Och därmed så blir vi pressa och tätt upp mot varandra. Och så blir det i konflikt. Motorfärmsen och den moderna mänsken har också begynt att bli en utfordring för oss. Som man vet det har varit en explosiv ökning av antal snöskuter och ATV som benyttes i rekreation av folkhus på Rengusnäring som igen har medfört betydlig folkhus på Rengusnäring. Det har också varit ett press från allmänhet om att få en mer liberal motorfärdsstad något som Rengusnäringen har inte varit särskilt stort samtidigt. Rengjusnäringen upplever också större antal jäger och fiskare som önskar att driva med jakt, fangst och fisken i Rengjusnäringen. Rengjusnäringen har tagit med detta med att pröva och komma i dialog med jakt- och fiskeforeningen. Slik jäger och fiskare i större grad har klarat av att det finns Rengjusnäringen och vad de kan och ska upp det för att undgå konflikter med näringen. Det är i midlertid aktiviteter som ligger utanför de enkelte regnskyttorns påvittningar och regnskyttornäringen vill ha behov för välvilliga från myndighetens sida för att få regelverk som regulerar slika aktiviteter i regnskyttornäringen. Och då över till det hur idag snackar norsk. Då är det först och främst i förhåll till förvarsning. Och som vi husker tillbaka i tid och som vi förstår av historien upp igenom. Så var det för att komma och se ut av de problemen som måtte uppstå så hade man lokalkunskapen och näringskunskapen för att lösa upp i de kloken. Och då gick man och diskuterade det själv och fann en måte att komma ut av det. Men världen har blivit vind på bakgrund av det som har skett runt oss. Och idag så har vi många förvaltningsdelar. Den första förvaltningstiden var vårt eget. Då var vi här i vårt eget hus. Men idag så är förvaltningsregimet nog helt av. Idag så har vi, för vis min åsida med penor, mer förvaltning som det blir sagt. Och då vill det säga det slik att då må vi kommunicera med någon andra för att få en förvaltning som där står i stil med vårt näringsutövelse och ända i tillägg till många andra intressen. Och det har då gått över till att vara myndighetens förvaltning. Då är det myndigheten som förvaltar. Och då är det plötsligt du som har blivit tillhörd i ditt eget rum. Och då skyves då förvaltningen fram och tillbaka. Någon gång är det lokal förvaltning, andra gånger är det nationell förvaltning. Och till slut så kommer du till internationell förvaltning. Så du har väldigt mycket att hända upp i. Och då är det svårt viktigt med kommunikation. Och då hade det varit nyttelöst för en som ska fronta sin sak och snacka samisk. Och då vill han inte nödda fram. Därmed så måste han ta andra steg. Sånt som i Norge, vi måste kunna norsk för att kommunicera med dem som då är förvaltade. I historien så gick det rätt med samisk. Men idag så är det hopplöst. Och man ser ju utvecklingen i det här. Nu ber vi om hjälp från andra. Och det språket det snackar idag är engelsk. Internationaliserat. Så därmed så måste man också hämta mer hjälp och finna ut av det och få fler till att involvera sig i vår problematik för att få en förståelse och, och bringa det fram för dem som måste vara dem som då har beslutning. Så därför så är det väldigt viktigt för oss det är språk och för att komma tillbaka igen och få den förståelsen som det en gång var vår näringsgrundlag och det som var grundfinaren då vi startade en del. och det som vi har haft till ny tid men som dessvärre i dagens tempo kanske kommer till att få svinna. Hvis forskningen får det rätt 50 år så är det slut med den romaniska regeln. Så det är den faran vi har hängande oss över oss hela tiden. Plus och i tillägg till allt annat 
som måtte være fra nasjonalmyndighet, som da henger som tøste for oss. I Norge er reindriften, og spesielt i disse områdene i dag, så er reindriften veldig best, uten at jeg nå skal gå inn på akkurat de problemstillingene. Men at vi er fresta i dag, det er, det er så sikkert som det er sagt fra myndighet. Takk. Strong contribution in our discussion. Uh, uh, a question or comment to the new Henry? I mean, as far as I could see, you know, you throw the whole old management regime, 40 years, it didn't work. That's, I'm concluding it. Yeah. And then, you want, are you able to contribute with resilience, thinking, uh, social, ecological, um, uh, management regimes for the future. Are we able to see a nomadic Saudi Arabia husbandry in the new oil region of Europe with using all your thinking and expertise when you're listening to him? Nobody asked. Is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what, well, to begin with, there, there's no resilience without understanding the system and the system complexity, uh, which, which is very, very clearly portrayed. But I think that one of the critical elements that is repeatedly uh, coming back in, in this uh, very, very important intervention is the encroachment and grazing land. And of course, for any pastoral system, when it comes to resilience, you don't have a diverse access to grazing pastures, you're losing resilience. So I think that, that's one of the very critical issues because what resilience provides you with is the ability to be extremely flexible under changing <coughs> extreme conditions, which of course is why there is in any control system anywhere in the world the need to have a high degree of diversity when it comes to uh, pasture. Now, I'm not sure how far that pressure is pushed under the order which you are seeing, but I think that's kind of the key driving forces to better, to better understand. And then whether, whether the, the feeding uh, strategy, which is then uh, the adaptive strategy, as I understand it, to deal with this reduction in grazing access, how, how sustainable that is, and to what extent that provides resilience. So it places the whole reindeer system in the hands of the market, which in itself is volatile. The market uh, uh, from the World Wildlife Fund has also uh, uh, the world. But the, his problem is that uh, when he talks about one year is not another year's brother, uh, uh, change all the time, the the government uh, and the governance of Norway is not willing to re listen to resilience thinking. Of course, I'm not here necessarily in my capacity in what one does, but um, <laughs> as, just to stop some discussion short here, especially if you want some um, But uh, I have two, uh, two, uh, two aspects that I took from your talk where resilience actually might help very concretely. The first one is that you mentioned what sounded to me like a mitigating approach to the pressures that you have experienced coming from the governments, where you said that even though you sit at the table, you are always losing vis-a-vis um, -vis lots of pressures from uh, cabin building and, and others that you mentioned. So I think that is a mitigating approach, even though it was probably set up in the best of of meanings to to having um, multi-stakeholders across the landscape management. I think a resilience approach has a more caring, uh, forward-looking approach to, uh, to offer. So that, I think, is something that is an element that, that can really fruitfully contribute, I think. The second one that I heard you saying is that you have uh, multiple growing um, pressures and also accelerating like that. individual from uh, change, from predators, from increasing motor traffic, from hunting and fishing. 
And I think the resilience approach would offer a more strategic, forward-looking chance to actually handle these pressures rather than just an ad hoc looking at what's happening now approach. So these two things I took from your talk. Lägger du om på något det gör? Om man lägger om? Ja, eller resilience. Resilience på något det Ja, vi sa att jag går över till det sista som då var ett spörsmål i förhåll till det och inte sytt och värst i förhåll till, till det. Men det har vi ju inte gjort när man ser på historien när det gäller rengift. Så har vi väl kanske varit den som har tillpassat oss de utfordringar som har varit ja, upp genom historien. Så långt det är möjligt. Men ett steg går ju också gränsen på att ta är målet nått. Och då är det inte nog mer att tillpassa sig i förhåll till. Då måste man tänka sitt framtid framåt. Har han nått målet nu? Och, och hvis målet är nått så måste man ju också från den andra part acceptera det att nu är målet nått. För visst vi ser tillbaka på historien på hur regnbysnäringen har mått att tillpassa sig i förhåll till det som har skött vänta. Och det vet ni ju också som det är det är något för släppning då. Och så är det inte She talked to us in Sami. <laughs> Ja, 
تلاش آقای دیت میلرس شده پرموز
when you told me to talk to radio herders about resilience four years ago, I found that actually quite an easy task. Because all the radio herders don't use terms like resilience and don't, don't use terms like uh, uh, adaptation, etc. Uh, the, um, the core thinking of resilience is uh, indeed very close to the core thinking of, uh, of radio herders. And uh, indeed, I argue that there are some uh, core strategies for resilient build, resilience building that are inherent in the CETA. And these can be summarized in the, in the, the common themes of uh, the common themes evident in resilience literature. That is flexibility and diversity. And then in addition, of course, mobility. For example, for example, when talking about flexibility and, and the CETA system, you can refer to the Institutional flexibility of CEDA constellations. CEDA constellations um, can change and do change in, uh, in, um, in response to, for example, weather events, but also other, other events. Uh, in terms of diversity within the CEDA system, there is a focus on both social diversity and ecological diversity. Social diversity is very much stems from this family-based character of range. Uh, that you have a, a diversity of social capital <coughs> in the CETA, um, meaning that uh, that you, you might also have um, uh, members in the CETA who have uh, other types of training, uh, for example, who have done education while working part-time jobs uh, elsewhere, etc. Um, also, some um, in um, in talking about social diversity, you can also mention uh, diversity in economic. Uh, through engaging in, uh, in, uh, in different activities such as tourism, but also for reindeer herding here in northern Norway, um, a very important aspect is that uh, for most fam most families have at least one member who works in outside jobs to bring additional income. In terms of ecological diversity, um, an important aspect is. Uh, the diversity in herd structure, meaning that you have different types of animals in the herd. Um, since since some of you are not so familiar with reindeer herding, I can I can mention um, I can mention a, a few things about herd herd diversity. In particular, um, a colleague of mine in the ELA project has been um, has been um, doing her research on castration and the importance of castrates in the, in the reindeer herd. They are recognized as being important to, to uh, dig through hard snow layers. So. And of course, mobility is, uh, we've talked about this today already, but it allows for, uh, for uh, uh, adaptation to weather events and other events through flexible use of pastures. So what are the formal governance structures of reindeer herding in in Norway. Well, as we already heard, in San um, radio, radio herding is formally divided into a number of administrative levels. Mikanis was also mentioning this yesterday, that you start with the CEDA shares, uh, which is not necessary. it's not the same as the individual, but it's the one who has the license to operate uh, the reindeer. Move on to districts, summer and both summer and winter districts. Uh, reindeer herding regions, um, which are, uh, there are six reindeer herding regions in Norway. And, and finally, the national level of reindeer herding administration. And, uh, and this system of um, uh, organizing is uh, widely acknowledged to be uh, complex. And uh, there are ongoing efforts to simplify this system. Um, but there are, uh, there are not been reached any certain decisions yet to do this. Policy implementation through these formal governance structures occurs through the normal use of regulatory, economic, and institutional policy instruments. And these have been particularly focused on establishing administrative borders uh, between, um, between um, not only CEDAS, but also um, groups of CEDAS who migrate in the same areas. 
regulation, uh, regulating seasonal use of pastures, uh, regulating reindeer numbers. This is a big one in Norway, uh, probably the most discussed about issue uh, when it comes to reindeer herding in Norway today. Um, and this is done through management tools such as carrying capacity. And then finally, providing economic incentives for maximizing pr production, uh, maximizing the kilos of, of reindeer use slaughter. So in, if you contrast these formal governance structures of, for reindeer herding and these informal internal governance structures for reindeer herding, um, I've set up a little list here. You can say that formal governance structures are focused on set, um, establishing set administrative orders, while the informal internal governance structures are uh, focused on flexible um, administrative orders. Um, within the formal governance system, you have a view of units, a view of CEDAS, as being largely similar. The, the, um, and, uh, and the instruments uh, don't really make it uh, differentiate between CEDAS of different sites, different um, historic history, different uh, uh, how long you have been in the area, etc., etc. While in the informal governance structures, there is of course a huge difference between CEDAS. Also, in terms of um, uh, what type of political power one CEDA has within the system, uh, it's, um, they are not necessarily all equal. Uh, and of course, he does differ in size. Um, the formal governance structures further focus on control production conditions and foreseeability in production, this uh, stability thinking, which of course is very um, uh, alien to reindeer herders. And the internal governance structures, where you focus on more flexible production, especially um, adapting to the, the climatic year. Of course, in quad V years, like Ingemaier was talking about, you cannot expect to have uh, a high production uh, according to a plan. And finally, uh, the formal governance structures um, focus on maximum economic yield through effectivization of herd structures. And uh, this, of course, encourages herds that have uh, a very high percent percentage of females. While in the internal structures, but there is more focus on managing risk through diversity uh, in herd structures. And this, of course, um, <coughs> the, the failure of the formal governance structures to incorporate and include uh, this, informal, uh, this informal management does, of course, have, have consequences for the resilience building strategies uh, available to bring workers. Uh, it's uh, kind of self-evident that uh, what these might be is uh, loss of flexibility to administ uh, administrative borders, uh, uh, or homogenous herd structure, etc. etc. And, um, and my argument is that um, if, uh, if reindeer pastoralism is to have the best, uh, best possible uh, chance to maintaining resilience also in meeting uh, the ongoing changes, there is a need to look into ways and in how these two structures can be uh, in, uh, integrated in, in a better way. And there is a need to, in particular, focus on uh, the informal aspects uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, regular urban governments, which are not acknowledged in uh, in law or for policy today. And it looks like that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, Rana, we, we need some technical support here. Don't go. Can you can you fall talk here? Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, I'm already into the next section. Uh, uh, so that's so what you say how two governance systems should be one. And we heard from Canada, from uh, Ferguson yesterday, about he is not a believer in coup management from Canada. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Okay, sorry. Uh, so, a short comment to Elninga. Please. I'm provoking you to wake up a little bit. Tatiana, there's, but you have to come in the front there, please. No, 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 no. Come in the front. There's no way. And if you're quick, another one to Elninga. Uh, don't talk. I think we need to separate between how do we tell the story to the formal governance systems, why resilience is important. That's one thing, which is very different to how we build resilience on the ground. And what we're seeing is that all the governance systems we have, and, and, and driven very much from the economic system, is not based on resilience principles at all. In fact, they're based on 
efficiency principles. It's all about optimization, cost reductions, and pushing systems to the most, to say, beneficial outcome on the short-term economic basis. And there's so much research that shows that is in, in direct contradiction with resilience. So resilience is often quite expensive. Actually, resilience is all about flexibility, mobility, and diversity, as you pointed out. So we need to recognize that it's not only about how do we build resilient systems in the circle of polar environments, it's also about how do you convince formal governance of moving away from the only efficiency-based governance systems to recognize the importance of flexibility, mobility, and diversity, which may raise the costs on the short term, but may actually be very, very economically beneficial on the long term. I just want to make that distinction, because otherwise we kind of lose out on, on, on the reality here that when, when policies come from the Norwegian government, uh, which appear to be in contradiction with reindeer herding priorities, there, there's a rationale for the Norwegian government. They will say, you know, this is very rational, this is very efficient, but it's actually in contradiction with resilience, which is all about building the diversity to deal with shocks and stresses. So, so it's not only about investing in resilience on the ground, it's about um, essentially educating uh, politicians of why resilience is important. And I think we may have to think of the course. So the answer is the Arctic Resilience Course on the ground. It's enlarged as the parts. I completely agree with you, Joanna. I don't really have any a long comment to you, but I think we will get a very long way if we manage to uh, explain the importance of thinking long term. Uh, I think that's uh, we're quite a few steps ahead if we manage to do that. Thank you, Anninga. Uh, we will continue the discussion, so of course, later. And uh, uh, look, make sure you look for some nice people to work in your groups later. You know, something nice to come out of it. Then we are continuing. But then we move out uh, on the on the tundra. Uh, and uh, and uh, actually, Anders Eira is going to talk about one aspect which we don't hear so much about: how a, a nomadic system like this connects into the uh, market economy. And when the market economy doesn't really connect in, unless he's a reindeer herder here, he's on his way to bring his whole herd into the pen. That's why he's not here. Uh, he's the, he has his um, uh, master from economy in Bergen, and he is the previous uh, vice minister in uh, the conservative government in Norway some years back and he is also the previous director of the Sami University College. Now he is a reindeer I think, and he is coming to talk to us about market shock for reindeer husbandry. How the Norwegian state intervened in the reindeer meat market in uh, uh, 2010. And, uh, well, welcome to this session. There's a lot of people, I think there are 30 people at least listening to you here. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, I was just wondering which language shall I use? Sami, Norwegian or English? Uh, you talk the language you would like. But not the... Mm. Yeah. Okay, you have a, tra a translator there. Best if you use English. But then they have some technical problems, I got. Huh? English, please. If you. Can they talk in the hear? Are you able to hear? Can. Ole Kodorka. Ole Kod. Can can they hear? Ja, okej, då kan du prata att jag ska ta det. Men inte prata fort, alltså. Nej. Kanske jag har skrivit mina notater på engelsk. Nej, på norsk. Ska jag ta det på norsk? Det går ju. Men kan du sätta det lite väl, för det må gå till engelsk. Ja, eller kanske jag tar det. Är det flest engelsk i tillhörare? Engelsk språk. Ja. Ja, precis. Okay, I can I can take it in English. It's okay. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, 
thank you for the invitation to come to uh, have this speech about uh, the, the reindeer meat market and how the, the shock, uh, uh, that there was a shock in the market two years ago uh, as a result of, uh, uh, of the state intervening the, the market, as Swain mentioned. Uh, I'm talking uh, on, on behalf of a small reindeer meat uh, processing company. Uh, it's, uh, the name is Verte AS. It's owned only by reindeer herders and six reindeer herding uh, districts. And we are uh, selling reindeer meat for a few million Norwegian kroner each year and are uh, processing uh, between 1,000 and 3,000 reindeer annually. And we have also organized uh, slaughtering. Uh, but that's not the, the core of the business. Uh, the, 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 the case I'm going to talk about is the, this um, uh, market shock in uh, the autumn 2010, when the Norwegian uh, 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 a stock, uh, uh, a re regulating stock of uh, uh, You're breaking off on very much. Regulation and ten that the demand for reindeer meat fall. And uh, I think it was maybe a, a, a late effect of the financial crisis in, in Europe on, and worldwide. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, there was a strong political pressure pressure to reduce the number of reindeer in Norway. And uh, this pressure has been for many decades. The state wants to reduce the number of reindeer. And uh, uh, then the capacity of slaughtering is a critical factor to reach political goals of reducing reindeer, uh, number of reindeer. And of the autumn 2010, then the biggest players the, the, the biggest slaughterhouses and processing plants in Finnmark said uh, that they do not have the economy and liquidity to buy in more reindeer uh, meat before they had sold off uh, their current uh, uh, stock of reindeer meat. Uh, and then uh, uh, it became a, a, a political situation with a lot of pressure on the Minister of Agriculture who is responsible for reindeer herd. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, the result here was that the state established a system for the three biggest uh, players in the reindeer meat market of Norway, uh, the, the three slaughterhouses in Finnmark, and, and the state took the cost of uh, stock by establishing this uh, this um, uh, mountain of <laughs> of uh, uh, of meat, a, a regulating uh, uh, stock of of reindeer meat, and the state was using the Norwegian meat uh, giant Nortura as uh, a regulator regulator of the market, and Nortura is also a market player. But I will not. Uh, uh, touch so much upon this, uh, um, what shall I say, principal problem. I want to, uh, to uh, reduce the, 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 the wide of what I'm, I'm going to talk about. But uh, the state established this, uh, this state subsidized uh, stock of reindeer meat, and, and it, uh, uh, the result was, was uh, uh, at least. Two, it, it can divide it in two parts. For the companies that uh, these three companies that uh, came uh, that were included in this system, this was very uh, profitable because they could sell their existing stocks uh, to an acceptable price, and then they could start a new business in the autumn 2010 to to buy new reindeer into into the companies. And but the the companies that was not uh, inside this state subsidy system. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, for, for them, the situation became very difficult because they could not 
uh, get rid of this uh, 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 already existing stock. And they, they had not the economy to buy in more reindeer before uh, the, the existing uh, stock was, was sold. And for the reindeer herders, uh, this um, in, in Finnmark, the northernmost uh, county of Norway, the biggest reindeer herding area of Norway, and one of the biggest reindeer herding areas worldwide, uh, this uh, uh, state uh, subsidies had, uh, had the result that there were only three uh, uh, customers for, for, uh, for uh, uh, buying reindeer meat. And the reindeer herders, uh, because of that, they um, experienced a negative shift in demand. And with a, a classical economic theory, uh, that means and, and that was also the, the, the result in, in, uh, in, um, that uh, was experienced, that the price to, uh, to a reindeer herder uh, decreased dramatically. The other effect uh, ha happened in the other uh, end of the value chain of the reindeer meat. You got a shift in supply uh, on reindeer out in the market. And because Nortura that got the responsibility to regulate the market, they also had their own stock of reindeer meat from uh, uh, before. And, but now they uh, 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 get access to state subsidies and then they sold their uh, uh, stock uh, in the market to a subsidized uh, price. And that was uh, uh, what uh, we experienced in the market, that suddenly there was a lot of cheap Nortura reindeer meat out in the market. And uh, I have an example of that. A few months after the establishment of this, um, this state subsidized uh, stock, then a, a friend of mine who runs some hotels in Oslo, he showed me that he had bought uh, several tons of reindeer uh, meat uh, it, it was the steak or, or the, the schinke to 79 kroner per kilo. This was processed and packed, packed reindeer meat. And that's, under, that's over 50% reduction in, uh, in, uh, from the normal uh, price. And how was this possible? Uh, the, the, the answer is, is quite simple. Because uh, Nortura got the possibility to buy in uh, cheap, subsidized reindeer meat, and that uh, uh, led to a volume shift in the reindeer market. And uh, a volume shift means that the supply curve, and I'm, I'm talking uh, classic economic theory, that the supply curve shifted to the uh, right, that meant uh, uh, that, 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 that gave a new market equilibrium uh, regarding the price. And this, uh, uh, this price, this new price was uh, much lower uh, after the ship than before. And this uh, happened in an extremely short time. Uh, therefore, it is a shift, and, and, and uh, because it, uh, the, the demand doesn't move that along the cu curve, but the curve itself shifts, and, and uh, therefore uh, these kind of sh shifts uh, hits uh, hard, and is uh, in, in uh, it's a, a, a shock for the companies that has to deal with this, this kind of shifts. And what is the, the implication for the competition situation in for, for reindeer herd market? Or, or as a result of, uh, of this uh, state uh, 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 regulation? Well, uh, the state gave a, a, a competition advantage for the three biggest players, plus, of course, Nortura. Uh, instead of that, they had to reduce their price, prices, and, and take the economic, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, responsibility and the economic cost of, of, of to having this stock out in the market, then they just could send it further to Nortura, and the Norwegian state paid the cost. 
but the smaller companies that was not allowed to uh, to be included in this system they had to take this cost themselves and of course when you get a dramatic fall in the price of uh, in the price of reindeer meat out in the market then it means shortly told that uh, your uh, value in your company's balance uh, that can be uh, decided after at least two principles. It's the cost to take them in or the market value. But re the result is that the, the, the board in the company has an um, uh, responsible um, uh, player has to reduce the value of the reindeer meat you have in your stock. And in, in our company, uh, uh, the, the value of the reindeer meat was two-thirds of the total value of the company, 67%. The, the, the rest third, it was machinery and equipment. And uh, the company had at this time an, an, an equity capital of uh, around 30%. But then, because of this shock and decrease in, uh, in value of reindeer meat, then you had to decrease the value of the stock inside the company. And, so, and this, the result of this is that uh, suddenly one-third of the values in the company disappeared. And that is the same as the equity capital. Um, um, you have used 11 minutes now, and, and, and we, we, we are... Could you... Try to conclude a little bit. Yes, uh, but that, that, what was uh, that, that was uh, uh, the, the problem was that uh, that uh, uh, this uh, state uh, uh, establishment uh, was uh, um, uh, reduced or, or uh, to to, uh, to three companies, and and it was not a competition neutral no, uh, act. And, and you can ask, how was this possible? And this, is, uh, this, is, this was possible because uh, agriculture is, uh, uh, is not uh, a part of the EU uh, EES agreement. And, and then it means that the EU's uh, rules of competition uh, uh, do not, uh, are not uh, regulating the Norwegian uh, agriculture. And, uh, and uh, uh, what this meant, uh, that was uh, that was um, uh, what I what, what is my uh, what I was uh, surprised over that that was that uh, we didn't um, get we were not invited into the process discussing what should be done and uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and it would have been uh, easy out from economic theory to uh, to uh, uh, see what will happen when you establish these kind of shifts in the reindeer meat market. And, and, uh, and, uh, and the, the, we, we complained to the ministry of this uh, situation, that why could the, how could the Norwegian state do this? And they said that, um, that the answer was that this uh, regulation was only for the businesses in Finnmark that do, did slaughtering. But Ante, Ante, so uh, yes. the, uh, we have to wrap up because they are stressing, my cool chair is stressing me here. And, and, and the whole idea here to bring this kind of issue in, that the number of reindeer increases. And we are talking about the, the whole idea behind this, that the 40 years of management of reindeer failed. Okay? <laughs> and we have to be very smart to develop new methods. And I'm promoting also Stockholm Resilience Center is resilience management, resilience thinking, something we could use into the future. Because what you said, your shock also influenced the number of reindeer. That means pastures, and that means economy. Could you of course. Just, could you just, of course. My, 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 my cool chair is stressing me here. <laughs> Yes, I have uh, around. I have uh, the conclusion uh, uh, left here. Good. And uh, the, what this uh, meant that was that the, 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 this state regulation destroyed the competition on buying reindeer meat. That made the situation for reindeer herders difficult, and uh, and uh, their profit uh, decreased, 
and and then they uh, choose many of them choose not to deliver reindeer to, to sell reindeer meat and the, one of the reasons is that the the number of reindeer will increase and we see that today two years after now the rain, number of reindeer is higher than uh, for two than for two years ago and my uh, uh, my um, uh, advice to the Norwegian state and also to the Reindeer Herders Association uh, is it's when you, uh, that you should not go uh, and disturb the market by uh, implementing quantum or price regulation and, and especially uh, not uh, systems that are uh, only for some few of the companies in, 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 the, the, in the reindeer meat market. If you, if you are going to do anything uh, regards to price for quantum, then you have to include all the companies. And, and, uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and, 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 if, if uh, the state and, and the Reindeer Herders Association is planning any regulations, that they include uh, all the companies in giving advices on how, what can, what should be done and how it can be done. And not only give this right to give advices to some few companies, yeah, but uh, or in this kind of... Uh, we get that point, but what, you have, what we are trying to do here is a new into a complete different... Uh, thinking about management, a complete different way of thinking. So your argument won't be the case within some years if we are su su succeeding. But uh, I think uh, if you don't have any feedback, we'd like to say thank you, Anta. Uh, we yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. Thank you. Then, uh, it, it's a great pleasure to me to, to continue. Uh, in the last part of the 1960, a very young French uh, 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 girl came to this area, and uh, her name is Marie Royet. She works now at uh, sorry. Uh, she works now at the uh, International Center for Science in Paris, and she still works with Rene Husbandry, and she really works a lot with traditional knowledge, climate change and the whole issues of resilience, I think. But she works in Sweden, you know? It's about flexibility and constraining the use of knowledge. Is it not working? Okay. Industrial, industrial wood. So that's what happens sometimes. Yeah. But oh, no. so I will come back to uh, radio management plans. That's what I want to discuss to, today. Um, the idea of the government for this radio management plan was that uh, it would help the, the herders to have a modern plan in the same way as, as uh, the industry of wood had a, a plan, 
then they would help them formalize their plans and formalize their needs. And uh, for that, uh, as you say, as you see, uh, one of the things that was uh, needed was to use uh, mapping. And uh, they were using both uh, GIS and um, other maps. And the purpose was to work with the reindeer herders to make a collaborative uh, mapping. Uh, we realized, my student in, and I, that uh, we were scared, knowing uh, what the usually government do, that it would be very uh, uh, simple, simplify what the, the really the, uh, knowledge was. And um, so we organized, uh, with the people who were in charge of the reindeer management, management plans, workshop with a cedar, and with two cedars, and two persons in which cedar, uh, we took back the reindeer management plan and the mapping. And, and, and uh, uh, our methodology was to ask uh, the reindeer herders to begin at the beginning of the winter when they go down with the, with the herd, and to go uh, week after week, what, where do you do this year? Where, where, where do you go? And why do you go here? And why don't you go and in another direction? And um, uh, it was, we uh, were asking what were you doing usually when you're trying to map in your, uh, your uh, management plan. And what we realized is that by uh, showing uh, the rainy herders uh, maps, which were basically botanical maps, to show them where the lichen was. Uh, and by telling them to map their main areas, they were really simplified the reality a lot. Uh, so our workshop uh, uh, was uh, uh, trying to know what, what were the values or what, were the, what was asked to the reindeer herders. And we realized that they were asked to, to, to design a normal year. And as everybody had, has already told you, a normal year doesn't exist, as a normal year is not a bother of another year. So they were trying to do what they were asked, but it didn't make sense. And uh, by, we, we did that year by year, uh, first the year the current year, and then we went back as, as <coughs> long as we could really do a precise map, which in most cases was five years. So we could get five years back with uh, a detail of how the territory has been used each year. And uh, that was a normal winter, for example, but you will see that uh, the, the, the another winter with uh, rain on the snow, which is the uh, most difficult conditions where the uh, reindeer cannot have access to the lichen, uh, changes completely the utilization of the same territory. It's, uh, it's uh, at the CEDA level, which means not at the administration level, because in Sweden uh, uh, the CEDAs are included in what is called Samebu, uh, it tr translated into English, uh, Same village. So it's a smaller unit, the, the CIDA unit you've been hearing about. And uh, so uh, the result of, of, of this consultation was that we found that for two CIDA, only three winters out of six had been so called normal winters. and, and uh, and fit with the reindeer management plan. Because the management plans were uh, mapping normal winter. And uh, if you remember what was the purpose at the beginning, which is to help uh, the reindeer herders to discuss, to exchange, and to give information to uh, uh, people who exploit the, the forest, which is the same place as their pastures. Uh, you realize that it's a very dangerous move to make plans and ask questions which are simplified, which the result being that the use when it's normal, you don't need help, it goes well. 
the use when it's not normal. I mean, it's really a problem. And if you really <coughs> map that you don't need these territories because it's not a normal year, then it means that you're uh, drawing yourself that in case of uh, a bad situation, well, uh, you don't have a territory. Because in case of conflict, these maps are going to be used. And the uh, uh, managers of the forest are going to say, well, you said that the normal use, you don't go there. So why do you pretend now just to bother us that you want to go here? So uh, uh, this study uh, with the reindeer herders showed that uh, uh, the benefits of uh, uh, reindeer management plan uh, could, could certainly exist, but only if it was done in a much more detailed way. Uh, and and the, the, the herders are, are really uh, happy to collaborate, especially the young herders, which who are quite uh, well mastering GIS and other tools, and they are very interested uh, to work uh, on, on with uh, uh, science and techniques. Uh, but um, I, I, I would see other dangers of this kind of situation. It is that um, not only that, well, we could discuss about reducing indigenous knowledge to quantitative data, that's another problem. It's when you equip the reindeers with uh, monitor them and then uh, decide to to uh, take this data as the whole herd. And as you heard, as you, you heard, <laughs> I'm sorry, also, uh, a reindeer, not only a year is not a year, but a reindeer is not a reindeer. All the reindeers are, the, all the reindeers are different. So, um, obviously, if you are only uh, equipping some reindeers and do not know what you do, you are giving also false indications. So science and technique and uh, traditional knowledge, I believe, can really collaborate together. And uh, our uh, uh, next program uh, with people also like Erlach and uh, uh, people in Sweden is going to be uh, to, to, to try and uh, push the idea of co-production of knowledge, but not uh, in, in, uh, uh, in a way ignoring uh, to what is traditional knowledge and maybe uh, some kind of research like what we do with ethnoecology, uh, which, which could help uh, uh, be in a way, the intermediary between the herder who knows he's been asked all kind of stupid questions, that was the title of my presentation, and has to try and make a good answer to a stupid question, which is not always easy. So the role of science in some circumstances could be to help uh, uh, to be together. As you, you said with the resilience theory, to be together with uh, reindeer herders to s and traditional knowledge to tell politicians or even uh, some kind of rapid manage manage management science that the question is not well worded and that you can't give a good question to a bad answer, a good answer to, a good to a bad question. <laughs> but a nice conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. So it's actually the same story, also from Sweden. Uh, uh, I, we have a coffee break now, and my pool chair is kind of sitting on my neck here. And, uh, uh, so I, uh, uh, and we have one presentation left, and that's my presentation. But uh, I have decided that my presentation is going to be more about my students, so uh, which means uh, Rauna, Eli, and Anna. Uh, so we take a coffee break now, I think, and then we start with my kind of presentation. Okay, we take uh, so we start again at eleven o'clock, and then because I think it's important that you listen to some of their stories. Okay, thank you. Eleven. In Yeah, I took this.
is a lot of claims of different kinds of minerals. Uh, this is how the grazing land looks like here today. So, uh, green is more than five kilometers from development. Okay? Uh, so what you see is that if the oil and gas development in the Barren Sea develops as planned, the grazing land in 2030 will look like this. And you see the problem, as also Nils Henrik said, is the coast which hit. And that's the carving land, it's the summer land. That's where you have this huge impact on development. So what I'm trying to say, nomadism is challenged. Nomadism, which was the whole key for adapting to this area. Okay, I won't say anything more than, I will give the uh, word to uh, one of our uh, uh, Master of Science, Rana Berit Maria Aya. Uh, she is uh, just finished her master uh, uh, at the University of Tromsø. And now she works with us uh, at the Elat Institute. And this is uh, Rana's uh, thesis, because she has a unique story. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I was in a preliminary program, but then I kind of took myself away because uh, I had so much of these practical issues to think about. But then it's very interesting to me. It's very to me that you get two minutes tomorrow. So he wanted me to present some part of my thesis, and um, I've been looking at the use of traditional knowledge in when unpredictable events occur. <laughs> and one of uh, one unpredictable event which I have been stating is the introduction of the reindeer Hutton law in 1978. Um, before that, um, as you heard yesterday, when Mikkelins was talking about the SIDA system, then the SIDA system was very existing with the families working and um, herding and migrating and all that. But with this new law, which came in 1978, um, there was a lot of changes brought to the reindeer husband, to the sea that system. And um, which also, um, well, I, I won't say that it was a bad thing, but everything was changing, modernization and etc. But the point was that this law was kind of a uh, um, rapid change for the reindeer herders because some of them were not even aware that now there is a law. And then the father of the family became the leader of the herd, and the parents, the, the mom and the children, are kind of beside. And uh, so this was a new thing, and there was a lot of other changes uh, introduced. So I said in my thesis that this law was an unpredictable event for uh, reindeer herders. And I know there is a Sami lady behind there, she is my godmother. And uh, if you would like to discuss more of this, which, uh, the, which uh, changes came, she knows uh, a lot about it because she's been very, um, she's been uh, uh, thinking about this issue a lot. So I encourage you to talk to her about how it changed the family base when you're asking into a one man economy, as Eric Raymond has said. And then, in my thesis, I was also looking at this new law. But I don't need to say so much about it, because Elminga was already talking about it. That of this concept of the SIDA is implemented in the law, but in, in practice, it's not, uh, um, it's not in use. So I would say that uh, the new law is not um, recognizing the use of traditional law because uh, in the new law, every district or SIDA must make this plan. And this plan is uh, where you decide the number of reindeer, where your migration route goes, and so on. But the authorities are not giving the responsibility to the SIDA to decide on these things, because they are anyway interfering in all these processes. So that was my two minutes. Okay. <laughs> So, governance uh, as an abrupt change, people were not prepared. At loss, at least not the consequences. Structure of the law changes. Traditional knowledge was lost. Thank you, Rana. Excellent. Do you have any comments for Rana? Questions? 
I mean, this, I mean, we are diving into this discussion now. Okay. Um, and uh, my final uh, comment then is Eli uh, uh, Skum. I have to concentrate that because she's just a little bit married. Eli uh, is there. She's a, a PhD student in veterinary science uh, uh, working with OSEA. And she takes her PhD. Actually, this is her work. Is it possible to build the resilience to climate change by including castrates into the herd? It's actually rainy herders build the resilience in rainy husbandry by spreading the risk to investigate it in biological diversity. So a herd is actually a complex structure of different kind of animals which have to behave in a particular way, you know, which you have to control at all season, at summer, migration, at, and winter. And then, you know, people have been castrating to have control. To have, I mean, usually there is a little bit more males than females born. And before 78, as Rano said, you usually have 40, 45 percent males in the herd. Today, it's five. Because we got this 78 act and the efficiency by meat production. But it was not so efficient. It, as you have heard, it was actually vulnerable to all these other changes at the same time. And people ask why the number of rain increased. You get rid of all the males and then <laughs> you get double the females and they produce a calf each year. I mean, <laughs> it's quite logic, isn't it? <laughs> and when the grazing condition is high, of course, you get a lot of animals. So, but, but as I understand early, it's built in a kind of trying to be stable by having these castrates. There. Stabilizing, you produce meat over some years instead of a short period. And then early said, find out that it's not only castrates. So here you have an intact animal, and then you have a hard castrated animal. And then you have an in gently castrated animal. So Eric, you could talk with her in the... She has a really rich story. Yeah, you could come and say something say yourself. Just one sentence uh, about the castration. And then I'm going to ask Eric to like a cruel method in uh, bad animal welfare. But when you go into this material, you see that the, the traditional knowledge how to use the castration has a consequence that gives the herd uh, uh, higher survivance, survivance and uh, better animal welfare. So in fact, you sacrifice a few animals to get very good animal welfare. Uh, because you have the, the strong um, animals which don't go into rut, they don't get tired, they are there, take care of the calves and the females, so they get grazing. So the radio herders in the Arctic, they in invest to keep uh, male radios that don't give so much calves. It's not the, uh, like in agriculture, good way to do things uh, uh, give good economics. You want more calves, you know, but the Samis traditional, or all, not only the Samis, but all the reindeer herder, herders in the Arctic have learned that the bulls give safety and good animal welfare, and the castrated bulls are very important to, to, to give this stabilization, like a resilience method. When you have hard winters, you no know, access to food, they will give stabilization. That's a talk. Thank you. <coughs> So, and, and just to conclude that, for example, the terminology about this is rich. And this is not thing which was detected yesterday. It's very rich. That by fighting the testes, you could have a degree of frustration for it. And, and you could have a different kind of behavior of the animals and the herd. So that's it. Okay, so I'm finishing that. Uh, training. 
is the most important thing. And we have a future training of future indigenous Arctic leaders program here, uh, trying to capture all of this. And uh, uh, actually, we uh, are very fortunate that Prince Albert of Monaco is supporting this. Uh, so he, this is the classroom, and this is output in there, there just for curiosity. So uh, he believes in what we do, and we hope that we could have a strong cooperation also with you guys in this training course, building resilience into this indigenous society in the future. Okay. Sorry, Kevin. Now it's yours. Now it's yours. <laughs> while while uh, she's finding the presentation, if you have any kind of comments or or uh, questions, use the time. <laughs> yes, please come on. <laughs> so I guess I'm wondering why it's still considered a new law, and the shock is still being felt, maybe, um, and I'm wondering what, if anything, is being done or can be done, this law is still in effect, is that correct? And how well, there's a new law. <laughs> maybe it's just how it's being so explained, that we get used by it. Yeah. It, I meant that the 1978 law was new for the ranger murders at that time, yeah. because I've been talking to some and they said, no, I came to the village and then I heard there is a law and now they have a leader for the kind of each permit, you know, this Siva uh, which Elmi Guy explained about. So it was new for them at that time. And then it went some time and in 2007 a new law was adopted, which in, um, in, included the Siva concept, okay. which also, uh, this, uh, which Elmi was mentioning and the uh, but this SIDA concept is just in the name. It's not working in the practice. And the new law, sorry, the new law in 2007 mm -hmm. still has the same structure in place where it's the men who have the property rights yes. for the SIDA mm -hmm. and the family is excluded from that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So in the next hour, in 10 minutes, we're going to do a practical exercise together. And Spain, Alison and I were charged with the task of trying to come up with an exercise which attempted to get down on paper some of the learnings that we've heard over the course of the two days so far. Um, and what we're going to do is attempt to generate together um, an historical timeline. Now, we've seen various versions of this already through um, the two days. So, for example, uh, yesterday you saw this historical timeline, um, which focuses on um, the, the bad years. And you also, one of the groups yesterday also generated this, which expands over a much longer time frame. Um, and, and so what we're wanting to do, and it will be working in groups, um, is to focus on what are the key events or changes over time that have affected reindeer husbandry. And if you just have a little peek behind you, on the wall, once groups have generated that, we're going to put up the information on the wall. So we try and get an integrated picture of the changes that have happened over time. Um, when you're doing this, we want you to think um, broadly about the types of changes. So we've put down some examples of those um, on the board. So think of social, cultural changes, technological innovation, economic, environmental, political. We've heard many of those over the course of the two days here and there. Um, think of events. They might be one-off events that are maybe happening more or less regularly. 
um, or it may be more trends. And again, we've heard some of those tre economic trends, demographic trends, and so on. Um, uh, should I? I can show you an example of how we want you to. We've got post-it notes that we're going to give to different groups, and we'd like you to write on each post-it note the year that the event happens, if it's a particular year, or if it's more of a driver of change, try and represent that somehow, it might be between these years or something, and um, and write the nature event, it might be um, whatever happens, law change, or you know, snowmobiles started being used, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and then what we will do, um, after we've given groups sort of 20 or so minutes to, to work on this, to fill in your post-it notes, we'll come back and basically try and add to this timeline that you saw yesterday, populate it with as many other kinds of events and changes that we've heard over the past couple of days and that you know of from your own experience, be it local knowledge or be it scientific knowledge, um, local or, or more from an international perspective. Um, what we'll do after that is, is reflect after people have had a chance to put that on the board at the back um, and talk feedback to the broader group, some of the discussions they had. We'll then think about those two questions that you unposed for us yesterday. What are the concerning patterns that we see in the historical timeline we've generated, the threats to reindeer herding, uh, husbandry, and what are the what are the sources of resilience that, that were evident over time? 